Yeah, since uh, last few weeks, we are meditating on uh, the Lord's, Lord's Prayer. Yesterday, Manavo asked me, what is the scripture portion? I gave the same scripture. I said, it is just, it is just like the previous one. After saying that, I started thinking when we read something, when we hear something more, uh, more and more again, and as we become more familiar, we tend to read over those scriptures. So this is one among them. The Lord's Prayer, it has been uh, read so many times. It has been said so many times. And there was so much written about it. Since we are reading and hearing and saying it several times, uh, we tend to read over it and we, we may not uh, pro give the proper attention uh, that it, the Lord's Prayer requires. So as we are reading the scripture reading the last four weeks, we are reading the same thing. So I felt, are we going to again read over? So I want to make sure that we are not going to read over so, through my sermon so that we may be able to find the great depths or great depths uh, of um, uh, kingdom of God that God wanted to communicate to us through the prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples. This week we are going to study about the next phrase that we have studied our and then our father then our father in heaven then we studied uh, our father in heaven hallowed be thy name. Now we come to the next step that is thy kingdom come. Okay. Kingdom of God. So much was written about it, so much was said about it, and we might have heard several messages about kingdom of God, and but still, each and every person have their own perspective about kingdom of God. Today, what I would like to try is not to show the perspective that I have, but try to interpret the scriptures and try to find out the kind of perspective Jesus was having when he taught the disciples and asked them to pray, thy kingdom come. So the kingdom of God is a very well-known subject to all of us and uh, many a times this is called kingdom of God and sometimes it is called kingdom of heaven but both are uh, both words are used interchangeably and you find it 105 times in the New Testament. If anything is written one once in the Bible it is important. If anything is written 105 times it is much and much and much more important so the kingdom of god is a very important lesson that we have to learn from the scripture and the kingdom of god is the heart of jesus preaching jesus the moment jesus started his ministry he said he went to galilee and started preaching repent and believe the gospel because the kingdom of god is at hand or the kingdom of god is near the real translation, the true translation is repent and believe the gospel because the kingdom of God has already come. Kingdom of God has come. Uh, that's what you find in the um, uh, book of Mark when Jesus, when Jesus started preaching. He said the kingdom of God uh, has come now. The time is ready and the kingdom of God has come. So that is the message Jesus preached and the entire uh, gospels, all these four gospels, they do speak about the kingdom of God. How many of you heard about any parables in the Bible? Right. What these parables are about? How do these parables start? We studied about parables. Now all the parables start like this. The kingdom of God is like a man. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God uh, is like a treasure. The kingdom of God is like a man or a woman. Some kind of things. But the description starts with these words. The kingdom of God is like. So in fact, all the parables, they start with this description that tells the parables are all about the kingdom of God. By which we can understand the important the importance of the kingdom of God. And this is the kingdom of God is the message that the children of Israel were waiting from hundreds of years. And the kingdom of God is the message that the prophets always prophesied. Read Isaiah, read Zeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. All these prophets, they prophesied about only one thing. That is the kingdom of God. And one example we can find is from Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. 
where it is written, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. In other words, the kingdom of God has come. These verses are talking about the gospel and this gospel is all about the kingdom of God. And this is the prophecy all the prophets prophesied in, in some or other kind of term words they might have used. But this is the main theme they have prophesied. And the children of Israel were waiting for it for years. And Jesus came, started proclaiming about the kingdom of God. And another thing we find in the Bible, this is the teaching from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What is the most important thing that we have to seek in the life? And Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. First thing you need to seek in your life is the kingdom of God. So which tells it is very much important for us and I don't know how strongly I can stress the word important. And if you know any other words, please let me know. I'm, I'm running short of my vocabulary. Such a deep importance, great importance, uh, the Bible is giving for the kingdom of God. So which tells us it is very important for us to understand what this kingdom of God is. Right? So what is this kingdom? What is the kingdom of God? Many have many opinions, as I said, but I would like to bring before you few common and mostly uh, the opinions which people believe. Okay. Some people believe the kingdom of God is political. Example are the children of Israel. But in the Bible, we find that kingdom of God, Jesus, that Jesus preached, it is not a political kingdom. We'll explain more about it in the next slide. So people think kingdom of God is political, but Jesus did not preach that kingdom. And according to Jesus, it is not God taking people away from this world to a place called heaven. For many kingdom of God is going to heaven. People are waiting. I want to go to heaven when Jesus would come. But according to the words of Jesus, the kingdom of God is not just about going to heaven, uh, to, uh, to this place. And according to Jesus, it is also not the end of the world. And where God replaces this world with a new world. These are, these are the more, most common opinions people have. Okay. And this kingdom has both now and not at aspects. And you heard so many messages about it. So I am not going to touch that part. Uh, so I am not touching about now and not at aspect. But I would like to, to look what this kingdom of God uh, from another uh, angle so but it has both now and not at aspect so I'm not uh, denying it we find that Jesus used the language of the revolutionaries but he reinterpreted it during the time of Jesus there are so many messiahs who have come and they, they said they are going to establish the kingdom of God and some of them have started wars against Roman and have lost uh, in fact thousands of lives. This is a revolutionary teaching. Israelites for hundreds of years they were waiting for the kingdom of God and they, un while they were being ruled by someone else. While somebody is ruling, talking about the kingdom, about a kingdom of their own, is actually revolutionary number one, and it is anti-national for them. So, in the Roman rule, if Israelites speak about the kingdom, that means they are they are revolting against the against Caesar. This is the language Jesus was using. The word "kingdom of God" he has a revolutionary. It's a revolutionary language. And Jesus used the same language, but he reinterpreted the same words. And in fact, it is revolutionary because it is about something which would happen dramatically as a result. God's promises would be fulfilled. What is a revolution? Revolution is about something, an event is going to take place, an act is going to happen, or something, some kind of uh, uh, enlightenment is going to come because of which the world is going to be different. 
because of a particular act, the world is not no more. It's not going to be the same. We all know about revolutions. We all we know about French Revolution, Russian revolutions. We have studied industrial revolution. We have studied because of part a particular event or because of some particular ideas, the world is no more like this. We all can witness how the world was fifteen years ago, when internet was not very very much used, right? The moment internet was you, internet started came into the world and people started using, you know how drastically the world changed. So revolution is about it. Something is going to happen because of which everything is going to change forever. And Jesus also was believing something is happening and he is going to do something. The kingdom of God has come and he is using this revolutionary language because he is going to do something because of this. The world is going to change forever. And it is talking about, it's a new way God will be taking charge. We heard about so many kingdoms that will be taking charge. But when Jesus used this revolutionary language, what he meant is the kingdom of God has come. In a new manner, God is going to reign. And the promises given to the prophets, and they have been fulfilled and they are going to be fulfilled. Because God is going to take charge of the world. It's not in the same manner, but in a new manner. In political sense, if you look at this, many of we Israelites were believing God should establish his kingdom. That means that God has to throw away the kingdom of Caesar and has to establish his kingdom. But the reality is the rulers of this world are not enemies to God. None of us are qualified to be called the enemies to God. No Caesar, no Hitler. No leader can be considered as enemy to God. Nobody can stand against him to be qualified as an enemy to God. And not even Satan. Satan also is not able to be, is not qualified to be called enemy to God. There is no enemies to God. There are no enemies to God. And in fact, the scripture says that God only appoints the kings according to Daniel chapter 2 verse 21 and he changes the times and the seasons he removes the kings and raises the kings so the kingdom of God is not a political kingdom because no human is enemy to God where God have to come destroy and establish his kingdom he himself is appointing the people to be the kings and even we find in the Bible, John chapter 18, verse 36, where in the conversation Jesus had with uh, um, Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate asked him, are you the king? Then Jesus, uh, Jesus answered and said, for this reason I was born. And then he continued, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Jesus said this, his kingdom is not of this world. The moment we hear these world words from Jesus saying that my kingdom is not of this world, two things we understand, two things usually people understand. Number one is it's not a political kingdom. That was very clear. And next thing is they, get, they start misunderstanding that he's talking about heaven. My kingdom is not of this world. The, the moment we hear this, his kingdom must be of heaven. It, his kingdom is going to be in heaven. But the, the reality is, it doesn't say the kingdom is not on earth, but in heaven. It doesn't say that. Because Jesus say, according to Jesus, my kingdom is not of this world. When he said this, its origin is somewhere else, but, but its destination is precisely for this world. My kingdom is not of this world. It's not just talking about some heaven. Its origin may be in heaven. But it is destined and it is aimed precisely for this world. That's what Jesus meant when he said, my kingdom is not of this world. We should not uh, read over it and we should not read into it. Which, uh, by, me, by which we can understand that it is not of this world, but it is for this world. And some say it is a heaven. It's talking about heaven. If it is so, Jesus' proclamation of her kingdom is not how we can escape from earth to heaven. Someplace. He never preached how we can escape this world and how we can go to heaven. And many a times you might be reading these words uh, like bumper stickers on cars. 
where it says Jesus is the only way to heaven. Ask where did Jesus ever say that? Jesus never said he is the only way to heaven. In fact, he never said he is the way to heaven also. He said, I am the only way to the Father. And Jesus did not come here. He did not preach a message saying, I, have, I will tell you how you can take, how, how I can take you all from earth to this heaven. If it is so, these words won't be said by Jesus. And Jesus was praying. This is called high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ. John chapter 17, verse 15 and 18, we find Jesus enters into the world. And he did not pray to the Father to take us away from the world. He said, he sent us into the world. And then he says, Father, I do not pray that you take away them, take them away from this world. Which tells it is not about going to heaven. The kingdom of God is how the life of heaven comes down on earth in, through, among his people. It is not how we people can be transported as Jesus is the great transporter to heaven. Kingdom, kingdom of God is not about that. But the life of heaven may be brought down to earth. That, that's a similar picture we find in book of Revelation also. The end of book of Revelation doesn't end like where human beings are go, will be going to heaven. We are, people are expecting Jesus will come and he will take us away from this world. But the book of Revelation doesn't end. Jesus comes and taking us away. But Jesus comes along with him. He brings the new Jerusalem into this world. It is not we going to some new mystical place. But a life of heaven coming down onto earth. So the kingdom of God is not a place called heaven where God rules. But it is a fact that God who is in heaven rules says N.T. Wright, a New Testament scholar, in his book, uh, uh, How God Became King. The kingdom of God is not a place where God Jesus came to transport us, but it is about a fact because of which we are going to bring the life of heaven into this world and where God brings his heavenly rule into this world. It's not about transporter, it's about transformer. I guess Nathan would be happy to hear those words. It's about transformers. So what is this Jesus and the kingdom? What Jesus do? Three things Jesus did with the kingdom. Number one thing Jesus did was Jesus announced the kingdom of God. We all know how he went and preached, be repent and believe the gospel for the kingdom of God is at hand. And next thing Jesus did was Jesus embodied the kingdom of God. And number three is Jesus empowered the kingdom of God. These are the three points I'll be discussing with you in the rest of my sermon. Jesus announced the kingdom. Jesus embodied the kingdom of God. And Jesus empowered the kingdom of God. We all know Jesus preached the kingdom of God is now. As I said, it has both now and uh, uh, not yet aspect. We can find in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 15. Now, after Jesus was put in prison, so John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, which means the kingdom of God is present. Time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. This is a now aspect and we all are waiting for the kingdom. And there are so many verses uh, where Jesus said, in the kingdom of God, it will be like this, it will be like that. So that is speaking about not at aspect. The fulfillment can be experienced in the future, but it is a tangible reality now. The words are alive even today for us. The kingdom of God is at hand. It is now. Not 2,000 years ago only. It is now. And it is a tangible reality. How that we are going to explore. Number two thing, Jesus embodied the kingdom of God. Uh, an early church father named um, Origen, he says, uh, Jesus is autobelicia. That means he is kingdom in person. The kingdom of God is not just a place. The kingdom of God is not just a system. But the kingdom of God is a person. 
that is Jesus. Jesus himself is the kingdom of God. That is what uh, this autobelizia means. That's what early church fathers were believing. Why Jesus is the uh, autobelizia or the kingdom in person is because in Jesus only, the kingdom, it is bringing together the divinity and humanity. Jesus is 100% God and Jesus is 100% man. Where humanity and divinity have come together, where God and humans have come together, the kingdom of God is about bringing these two together in one. It was accomplished in the person of Jesus Christ. That is why Jesus Christ himself is the person. Jesus is the kingdom in person even the old testament prophets were uh, uh, cried you know lord come how long are you going to take oh lord when will you come to set these uh, set things right which is establishing the kingdom the prophets cried when are you going to come lord and set things right when are you going to bring your justice into this world when are you going to grant us the peace when are you going to bring your reign into this world for which god answered with not with any revolution, but through a revolutionary person, Jesus. Jesus is the kingdom of God. And why? Because the whatever prophets asked, and Jesus was the answer for that, because he himself is God's justice. And Jesus himself is the peace of God. And Jesus himself is the reigning of God. On this earth, there are hundreds of scriptures we can find which speak, which speak. Jesus is the power of God. Jesus is the peace of God. Jesus is the wisdom of God. Jesus is everything that God is, and Jesus is everything that the people of God cried to the Lord, asking. That's why Jesus is the King. Is the kingdom in person. And then Jesus enacted the kingdom of God. Okay, as I said before, Jesus used the revolutionary language of the kingdom, but he reinterpreted it. And that is what I'm talking, I'm saying as Jesus enacting the kingdom of God. I don't mean uh, Jesus is uh, acting or uh, doing like, you know, which he, which he is not. But enacting what I meant by is he is displaying it. That's what I meant. He's doing things, you know, uh, according to kingdom of God, which is God's way of ordering things. And how does God's way of ordering things look? Matthew chapter 12 verse 28 says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And the healings, miracles, celebrations with the sinners, the, the, the order of God will be like this. There is no sickness. Sickness is healed. There are no demon possession and bondage. And God is going to set them free from the bondage. And there is going to be complete celebration. And there is not going to be any discrimination. Celebration is not only for the righteous people and the good people, but to all who are ready to accept God and repent and join his kingdom. And the celebration is with them. The world was despising the sinners and the tax collectors, but Jesus, he did not choose to despise any of them, but he has chosen to dine with them, eat with them, drink with them, and to mingle with them, which is a great picture of God joining his people. God, the divine God, holy God, joining his unrighteous people whose acts are filthy rags. He is joining with them and having the meal and accepting them as they are. The kingdom of God is all about his grace, where he accepted us, where we are. And he is bringing us out of it, out of our sickness and sin. And the kingdom of God, the world usually, uh, it is for the people who are in power, for uh, aristocrats. But the kingdom of God is for the poor, meek, oppressed, least, lost, lost, little, un unlike the kingdom of this world. Here, it is always about the rich people. It is always about the people who are in authority, who are in power, who are educated, who have uh, social uh, status. The kingdom of this world chooses only them. The kingdom of this world chooses the best in the world to bring good out of them. But God, he chooses the worst in the world to bring best out of them. That is what kingdom of God. And look at the parables. 
He gave parables about the least, lost, last, little things. And he compared them with the kingdom. Lost coin, lost sheep. First will be last, the last will be first. Okay, little things. You be, which are completely marginalized in this world. But in the kingdom of God, the way God does and deals and in his order of doing things is completely different where he goes to the marginalized. Jesus is the person who came and spoke about uh, uh, what we'll call uh, social justice. And no one else have ever done that. He went to the lepers and touched and uh, he sat with them and uh, he, he healed them. He accepted them. He accepted the prostitutes. He accepted the tax collectors and sinners. He went to the marginalized. And another thing we can see is we need to learn, uh, sorry, we need to relearn from Jesus what this sovereignty is. Because the moment we hear about the kingdom of God, another uh, synonym comes to our mind is the sovereignty, right? God is sovereign. What this sovereignty is. And Jesus, as he is reinterpreting the words kingdom of God, he enacted and have shown what the sovereignty is. We can see, uh, we can learn from Jesus. We can see in Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 to 28, we all know this incident very well, where uh, the mother of James and John, uh, children of Zebedee, right? Yeah. He come, comes, to Je the, comes to Jesus and says, Lord, give me a promise that my children are going to be in the right and left when you establish your kingdom. And first thing Jesus told her is, you do not even know what you are asking. It is not because Jesus wanted to tell her, it is a great glory which you cannot comprehend. That when Jesus said, this is no, you cannot, uh, you are not knowing what you are asking. He doesn't mean about the glory. Because the next verse it says, can you, can you guys take part in the baptism I take and the sufferings I go through? He's not speaking about glory, but suffering. And they said, yes, we can. And then Jesus speaks these interesting words and where he is redefining the sovereignty. Jesus called them to him and said, you know how, how the kings of the nation show their power to the people. How? Oppressing? Suppressing. Important leaders use their power over the people. It must not be that way with you because the kingdom of God is different. What is this? But whoever wants to be great among you, let them let him be your servant. Because the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Here he is redefining the sovereignty altogether. Ruling is not about be sitting on the heads of the people and drinking their blood, but taking the water and washing the feet of the people and serving the people. Because the Son of Man did not come to who served, uh, son of man did not come to be served, but he came to serve. That is a redefinition of sovereignty in the kingdom of God, which Jesus 100% enacted. The sovereignty of God revealed in his humility. Having everything, being the king, he humbled himself, even to the point of death. We can find out. Uh, uh, Jesus chapter 14 verse 12 G, uh, Jesus another next aspect we can see that Jesus is enable, enabling us to live according to the kingdom that's why he said John 14 verse 6 and, uh, 14 verse 12 you are going to do much more greater things than I did because we are in the kingdom of God so when we say thy kingdom come we are anticipating the kingdom of God and it is a revolutionary play, prayer. Anticipating the kingdom of God is a revolutionary prayer because we are asking God to come and take charge so that the world may not be the same anymore. And this is something that we cannot do. We have, a lot of times, a lot of Christians say, we have to establish God's kingdom in this world. And we have seen in the history how the bloodshed took place. That is why thy kingdom come is a humble prayer. In Jesus' words. It is not like, disciples, I gave you power, you go and establish my kingdom. He didn't do that. He gave them power and then he graced us to look unto him and say, Lord, thy kingdom come. 
with humility we may ask it is a revolutionary thing but the revolution of humility that's what we are. it's a prayer it is not something a commitment that we are going we are taking to do it we are representing the kingdom of god because this is a transforming prayer we are not going to live according to the order of this world but we are going to live according to the order of god which has been established and uh, demonstrated in jesus we live our lives in the jesus order when we ask god and say thy kingdom come it is a prayer where we are saying god take more of me take control of me so that your kingdom order may be in my day to day life that's what it, this prayer teaches about and the kingdom of god radiates from the body of christ because jesus reflected the kingdom of god in he enacted embodied the kingdom of god now where is the body of christ here it is you and i we are the body of christ so if we are the body of christ connected to the head who is our lord jesus christ then we will be radiating the kingdom values in his order through our lives and then when we say that kingdom come we are proclaiming the kingdom of god this is a missionary prayer as we witness jesus in the power of the holy spirit he said when the holy spirit comes upon you you will be my witnesses in jerusalem judea and even to the utter parts of the world when we pray god thy kingdom come it mean that we are going to witness him let me tell remind you when we prayed this prayer we are telling god we are going to witness him do we do we do that so the kingdom come it is a missionary prayer it is an anticipating prayer it is a revolutionary prayer it is a transforming prayer and it is a missionary prayer to say that kingdom come so in conclusion as we pray the kingdom come we anticipate it because we are the children of the king we belongs to the king we are the children of the king so we uh, we wait unto him and we know that jesus is the kingdom in person we represent it because we are the ambassadors of the kingdom or sorry we are the ambassadors of the king doing all things in the way jesus orders things and then we proclaim it because we are the advocates of the king who witness the power of the holy spirit we are the children of the king so we are anticipating we are the ambassadors of the king that's why we are representing it and we are the advocates that's why we proclaim the king whenever we pray thy kingdom come it is reminding us about these three responsibilities may god bless you